Hey, what is up everybody? Platform Disciple here. And today I'm going to be bringing you a video on kind of a game balance, game design space area, specifically with respect to designing new cards as well as rebalancing old cards while keeping in mind the state of how Infinity Wars is played by most players. And the kind of what's sparking this discussion for me is I think there are a lot of characters in this game that don't see the light of day. And I believe that is frequently because those characters uh, do not get the amount of stats or lower cost that they ought to have for being characters that are slower. And when I say slower, uh, you're going to quickly realize that when I say fast character, that means a character that immediately impacts the board. It does not necessarily mean a character that is low cost or high cost. I am referring to how quickly that character is able to realize its return on investment, where you spend resources on a character expecting them to do something. And I think that generally speaking, fast characters so ones with charge haste vigilance or even a deploy effect tend to realize their return on investment faster and more reliably than their slower counterparts there are exceptions to this of course there are there are many very very powerful slower characters in the game but i think that if there was a rule of thumb faster characters tend to be better. Again, lots of exceptions, but I think that there are so many cards that don't see the light of day because they have a similar cost and stat line to a different card that might be just the fast version of that character. And we'll cover that. So what I am not saying in this video is that charge and haste characters should not be part of the game. I am also not saying that all charge and haste characters need nerfs. I think there are some that might need to be looked at, but I don't think it's urgent. I think the game is actually in a pretty good state. Uh, I'm also not saying that all slow characters need to be buffed, but I will say that I think that a lot of slow characters could be buffed and that would be better for the game. And that's kind of a bigger part of the direction I'm heading in. I'm not I'm not so much saying gut all of the fast characters and make them bad. I'm more saying, hey, this character is really slow and has no business having these stats when it's not able to do its own. It's not able to do what it's supposed to do because of its cost and stats. And that is related to it being slow. Uh, I am also not saying that dis despite the fact that I think this would be really cool and exciting, and it excites me as a player, I am not saying that sweeting adjustments need to be made to all characters based on the thesis of this video. Uh, if the Infinity Wars team ever wants to make sweeping adjustments to every card in the game, I would be excited to, to get on board with that. Uh, in whatever way I can. Uh, if you want to give me a small loan of a million dollars, I will happily work part time for you um, or even for free. Who knows? But the point I'm making here is that that this is, excites me as a player. There isn't actually a really good in return on investment for doing what I'm suggesting in terms of rebalancing every card. Uh, but I think there are some cards that really could use a little little love, maybe. Uh, so let's move on. I want to talk about the benefits of fast characters. Uh, and we're gonna focus on charge characters because that will keep the video shorter and more simple. But I do think that a lot of the logic I am going to share also applies to haste, vigilance, and deploy effect characters. And the first thing I want to say is that in a game of Infinity Wars, you want to maximize the functionality of the resources that you spend. And I think a lot of people will frequently think about their curve and spending all of their resources every turn. 
And that tends to be a, a pretty good thing to be doing in card games, including Infinity Wars. But what you might not be thinking about is how do those resources that you did spend translate into having an impact on the outcome of the game? Uh, so it's not just that you want to spend all of your resources. You want the resources that you spent to turn into a return on investment. Then that brings us into slow and fast characters. If I spend five resources on a slow character, it cannot start to realize its return on investment until at the soonest, the turn after I've played it. Whereas if I play a fast character, it is able to start achieving a return on investment right away and the reason that matters is because infinity wars games like any other game have a finite number of turns the number of turns is variable from game to game but the games tend to run a certain amount of time uh with the exception of like control versus control but most of the time when you play your five cost character you can be telling yourself the game is probably going to end somewhere between like one and six turns from now most of the time or at least the the likelihood of the the needle fl flipping from one player to the other in terms of who has the higher chance of winning the game that needle is going to be really far in one direction by that point in time most games so what i am saying is not oh you you i'm sure you had the, the 30 turn plus game but for most games if you're getting to like turn 6 to 12 ish between that point in time you're gonna start to see that one player is likely gonna close out the game or have a significant enough advantage that the game will end at some point so that means that a slow character and a fast character both have the same number of turns to do something. And if you are getting closer and closer to the end of the game, the extra turn that the fast character gets to start that return on investment begins to matter more and more. So if we're looking at a turn where our opponent is going to kill us and we know that we are going to die, even if we can spend all of our resources in our hand on slow characters, those slow characters are no more useful than not spending those resources at all. Whereas if I have a fast character, I might be able to defend myself or create a, a situation where I have a tie. Okay. And uh, of course, this, this does um, affect even parts of the game where it's not like immediately the game ending. It can still catapult you into enough of an advantage or or recover from a disadvantage that uh it swings the game in your favor sorry about that we had to pause for a minute because the baby was crying okay so where were we so fast characters apply more pressure and i want to quantify that by looking at charge characters and how much damage they do relative to their slower counterparts. And because of how complicated Infinity Wars is as a game, uh, it's very hard to compare fast and slow characters a lot of times because they may have a lot of other differences associated with them. But I have found two cards that I'm going to use in ex as an example here. And I'm using them as an example, not because I think that... Um, the fast character is overpowered or that the slow character is underpowered even though i do think that a little bit uh the real reason is just because they're much easier to compare than most other fast and slow characters and our fast character is paladin of the flame dome this card is pretty much a staple in a lot of aggressive decks and one of the reasons it's a staple is because it has that special effect that protects it from kill effects like mass death but i am going to try to present to you that i think that what is actually powerful about paladin of the flame dawn or one of the things that's actually very powerful about Paladin of the flame dawn is just that it has stats and charge and that it is it is got stats that are comparable to 
other characters in the same slot that are the slow characters. Uh, and when I say it's comparable, I would say, as a matter of fact, in a lot of cases, it has the same stats that most two cost characters that are like dudes that you put on the board tend to be 6-6 six, six, and the vanilla flamed on two cost characters is 7-7. Seven, seven. But we're not going to be looking at that because we want something that's a little easier to compare even, which is Siege Breaker. And Siege Breaker costs the same amount. It's the same stats. They're both one purity and flamed on. So when you are building your deck, this is a real decision that you have to make. Would I rather play Siege Breaker or Paladin of the Flamed On? And Siege Breaker's value proposition is that it hits the enemy fortress extra hard. So if, if Siege Breaker is ever going to be better than Paladin of the Flamed On, it has to do more damage. Uh, because Paladin the Flamed On not only um, has a lot of other benefits, like the, the immunity to mass death, uh, the question is, it ha so, so Siege Breaker has to make up for, for it not having charge and it not having that immunity to mass death by doing more damage. But I'm going to present to you that I believe in most situations... Paladin of the Flamed On is the one that does more damage, even without that that extra four damage effect on it. So, uh, Paladin of the Flamed On. If you play Paladin of the Flamed On on turn two, and this is admittedly not a real example, but it will help illustrate it. If you play it on turn two and your opponent is doing nothing, you do six, then 12, then 18, and then 24. So that's turn two through turn five. Uh, it's pretty good, right? Now, Siege Breaker, if we go to Siege Breaker, if you play Siege Breaker on turn two, it's going to begin by doing zero damage. And then it does 10, and it goes up to 20, and then it finally goes up to 30. So at the fourth turn of the game if your opponent has done nothing at all siege breaker has basically broken even it's dealt two extra damage compared to paladin of the flame dawn if you manage to get it to the fifth turn of the game with your opponent doing nothing that is when it's managed to produce one extra attack worth of damage it goes to 30 versus paladin of the flame dawn's 24. The trouble here is, first of all, it takes a while for it to even begin to, to outperform Paladin and the Flamed On in terms of damage. Uh, and in most games, your opponent is not going to be doing nothing. So in most games, your opponent is going to defend or have removal of some kind to deal with Siege Breaker and or Paladin of the Flamed On. So in most games, the Paladin of the Flamed On is the one that's doing more damage. And we can illustrate this in a direct comparison too. If you and I are both playing Flamed On, if I play Paladin of the Flamed On, I get to hit you for six. And then I can defend with my Paladin of the Flamed On against the Siege Breaker that you played the same turn that I dealt six damage to you. And they trade for one, one for one. So I have managed to come out ahead because I have dealt damage to you, and then we've traded our two drops. They have different morale costs, but that's that's a whole different story here, and I don't want to open that can of worms right now. The point is, it's very, very hard for a slow character to out-damage a fast character, even when it has an upside like Siege Breaker that is specifically exists to do extra damage. Okay, but that's not the only advantage of being a fast character. Fast characters are much harder to play against. Uh, it is, it's strategically more difficult to play against and interact with fast characters like charge characters. Um, because they impact the game the same turn that you get to see them, they can be hard to plan around. 
So you can have a one drop that is positioned to trade with your opponent's one drop. But you might never be able to realize that trade because your opponent might play a card like Paladin of the Flame Dawn, in which case Paladin of the Flame Dawn will kill your one drop if you try to defend it, and they will get to keep their Paladin of the Flame Dawn and their own one drop, which puts you at a significant disadvantage. So even if you are a skilled player who is able to predict not just when, but which fast character your opponent is going to play, you might still not actually have a meaningful way to capitalize on that knowledge because your opponent is able to simply just play with more stats committed to the board every turn than you have. Because if the charge characters have similar stats to the slow characters, this charge character player is playing a turn ahead and you aren't able to catch up most of the time. As the board gets more and more complex, even the most skilled players are going to struggle to outmaneuver fast characters. It gets harder and harder because of how many characters and moving parts there are. But aside from character arrangement in combat, charge characters also are hard to interact with because they have a, a kind of like a form of untouchable for one turn. So the example I want to give here is, again, let's, let's consider... Paladin of the Flame Dawn and Siegebreaker, but we're playing against an opponent who has a card like Charged Bolt in their hand. If I play Siegebreaker, my opponent is able to interact with the Siegebreaker before it has re realized any return on investment. Any return on investment. It's, it, is, it hasn't been realized, whereas the Paladin of the Flame Dawn has already started to realize its return on investment because it couldn't be targeted in the same turn that it started that return on investment. And the question is, how many turns does my opponent need to not have the Overcharged Bolt for it to, to start to look favorable for Siegebreaker? And we've already covered that. My opponent has to have no way to defend or kill the Siegebreaker for three turns consecutively of it hitting directly. Uh, but yeah, anyways, the point is, fast characters are able to start doing something before they can be targeted by removal or other effects, and they're very hard to play around for many players. Okay, so I think we've, we've pretty sufficiently covered that fast characters are very good. Um, and I do want to, again, kind of come back to the fact that fast characters are not just charge characters it's also haste characters it's also vigilance characters and it's also deploy effect characters so like an example i want to give is that luca is very similar to a charge character in the fact that it adds stats into the assault zone potentially the same turn that it comes out um some deploy characters are are just as uh if not more um warping than the the charge characters so the point i want to get at here is that there's a lot of really really good fast characters uh and there's a lot of really really bad slow characters there are some good slow characters uh but i think a lot of the times the reason the slow character is bad is because it has stats that are too too close to like what the fast characters in their same slots have it shouldn't be close i think a really great example of a a well balanced and appropriately statted and costed fast character is cavalry paladin this card has it costs five but its stats are comparable to a, a inferior four drop. So it's, it's got a four drops worth of stats, but not even a good four drops worth of stats. I think that that should be the poster child for what a good, well-designed fast character looks like. And Cavalry Paladin is still a good card is, is the, the main point I want to make. Like I, I'm not showing you like a, a dead card, uh, 
But anyways, Cavalry Paladin has 12 plus 8. Its stats are like 20 for a cost of 5. Here's another 5 cost character that has stats of 20. Cards like Frontline Warrior have no business having stats even close to Cavalry Paladin because this guy has to work so hard to even come close to doing what Cavalry Paladin does in, in every respect. Now, this might seem like a straw man example. Frontline Warrior is a really bad card, but there's a lot of cards like Frontline Warrior that that just are dead cards uh, for the game. And it's not Cavalry Paladin's fault that this is a dead card. It is the fault of whoever thought Cavalry Paladin and this card should have similar stats. I think Cavalry Paladin is balanced, and this card is way too weak. And I think there's lots of examples like this one. So I think a rule of thumb is that for most fast characters, I think most fast characters should generally have stats that are similar to uh, a slow character that costs one less than the fast character. So if you have a card like Cavalry Paladin that costs five and has charge, its stats should be closer to a four drop than a five drop, and maybe even a not so great four drop. So that should be kind of a design philosophy for fast characters. But the real trouble is how do you make slow characters better? Because there is an obstacle, which is that in Infinity Wars, you can give any character the ability to be fast by including it in the command zone. So a card like Kali the Purifier is an example of a card that is so bad and sluggish if you put it in your main deck that most people will not play it in their deck. But when it has haste, it is strong enough to be worth taking up a command zone slot. So there is a really, really fine line between a slow character that is completely garbage and unplayable and a slow character that has good enough stats that it's worth being a commander. Kali is not overpowered, but you could take a card like uh, Frontier, Frontline... What did, I, what did I just pull up a minute ago? You could take a card like Frontline Warrior and you could screw up and make it... Uh, too good. I think ideally, though, if a slow character could be buffed to be good enough to be in the command zone, uh, or at least palatable in the command zone, that's not a bad spot for the card to be. I think it's a bad spot to the, for the card to be if it's if it's overpowered. Uh, but I think that a card like Frontline Warrior would be bad even if it had charge on it, is basically what I want to get at. And uh, that slow characters should be at least good enough that if they are played from the command zone, they are closer to a Kali than they are to a Frontline Warrior. I'm not saying every slow card needs to be commander viable. It, sh it shouldn't be. But more of them should be uh you know, I want few fewer frontline warriors. Okay. Uh, so in general, I think that there's a lot of unfortunately like missed design space uh, because the slow characters are just not statted correctly. Um, so like a, an example here is, uh, and admittedly this is this is so. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we're, we're, we're getting there. So slow characters uh, like that could be cool, like X the Oppressor. This guy costs five. He does nothing the turn he comes out. He has to be on the battlefield and not die before he can start achieving value. And his stats are uh, a, a very bad four drop and he costs five. Yes, he's got a powerful effect, but I think cards like X that uh, don't immediately impact the board generally need a little more stats than this 
Um, and this is, again, maybe a straw man example. But there's a lot of these cards that uh, I I don't... What I Okay, okay so we're, we're wrapping up here. What I don't want to see is somebody say, oh, X is weak. Let's add a deploy effect to him. Or let's make him have his effect work from the support zone that he so that he can start doing something the turn he comes out of the hand. I really, really like when a card is readable by the opponent before it does the thing that it does. I think it is good for cards to enter the support zone, the opponent gets to read the card, and then they can decide how to play around it. But for that experience to happen, slow cards have to be good. Sometimes, at least. And that I think that the game would be a lot more interesting and skill testing if there was a higher diversity of good, slow characters to choose from. And I know it's challenging because you can't take a card that is slow and just add stats to it and not expect it to become the next commander that people play just because it's a ball of stats. But it's something to think about, and it's certainly something that when I do the card rebalancing videos is going to be something that I think about that I'm going to very frequently, I think, be picking character cards that are in this category that I'm calling slow, and I'm going to be trying to rebalance them without making them fast. I would like more cards like X the Oppressor to be playable. And um, yeah, that pretty much wraps it up. It's quite the rant. Uh, clearly, I have a lot of thoughts on these sorts of things, and I'd like to hear other people's thoughts as well. Um, but I think that there's a lot of opportunity to make the game feel a little more dynamic if some of those slower characters are a little better. And uh, I'm gonna, I have one more thing to say, which is that I think a, another underlying issue that is driving this is that I think that the stat to cost curve might actually not be where it should be. Um, I think that like three drops, uh, actually, I think, I think most things beyond two drops start to to fall off inappropriately in terms of like i think they most cards that cost three or more uh tend to have less stats than they should have now i'm referring to the cards that don't get played i do not want to see something like uh like like bile imp doesn't need more stats um but the the point i do want to make is that there's cards like oh, that have stats that are only marginally better than a true drop that are cost three or even have the same stats as a, a two drop that costs three um all right but we're we're entering down another rabbit hole here so we're gonna avoid it and we're gonna cut it off and uh that's the video everyone thanks for watching really hope you enjoyed it see you all soon